Hello, everyone. I'm Lynn Cremando for Yoga You Online, and I'm here with Dr. Ginger Garner. Dr. Garner is an integrative physical therapist. She's the author of the wildly acclaimed book called Med Medical Therapeutic Yoga, and she's the CEO of the Living Well Institute, which she founded in 2000 in order to teach therapists and medical practitioners how to use integrative practices such as yoga, functional medicine, lifestyle medicine into their cl clinical practices. She has educated and trained yoga teachers, yoga therapists, yoga professionals internationally. How many, Ginger, like a thousand? Oh my gosh, a, a lot. Because <laughs> now it's virtual and now it's like- Oh, now oh, there's the sky's the limit. Uh, so, well, welcome. Thank you for Thank taking you. a little time to talk to me. One of your specialties is pelvic health. And I'm going to tap into that in a minute because you've been doing some really fascinating work with women and trauma and pelvic health. But the way I want to preface this is that the last few years have been really hard on women. There was already pay opportunity equity issues between the genders. Women were already holding up jobs parents, children, multiple things for less pay. But according to a recent report by a nonprofit organization, unwomen.org, COVID, the fallout from COVID has been disproportionately hard on women. Can you, I know this is one of your kind of passions. Can you talk a little bit about how the past few years have uniquely affected women? Oh my goodness. Um, just when you finished that last phrase, I got chills because I've been, I've been living it. And many of you listening are living that too. I am a mom of three, I have three boys um, that I'm trying to raise to be sensitive to these issues. I think part of the solution is raising up men to be sensitive of those issues and change it and work help us to, to, to work and change it. Um, I have two businesses. I have a brick and mortar and then I have, you know, virtual, I have both things going on in two different businesses. Um, and, and I'm a woman. <laughs> so, uh, and then I'm your sandwich between care of the young and care of the old, you know, at the same time. So I have felt that personal weight and heaviness, um, over the last few years, it, it seems like more than what are we moving into year three now of this. Um, and a lot and the things that you mentioned from the UN report, all true women shouldering that bigger burden already with lesser pay. And so now when I first started teaching trauma care in women's health, you could quote statistics like in some populations, like in, other, in some countries, it's 70% um, of people have experienced trauma and um, a you know, certain percentage of those, of course, uh, at least half of them are gonna be women. And then in others, it's 50. So what if one in two people, right, mm -hmm. have experienced it. And because there is such a pervasive problem with violence against women, that's where women have this higher risk because most violence is going to be committed, you know, against women. And that was pre-COVID, right? Yeah. And then COVID comes and it's like a tidal surge, a tidal wave um, and overcomes everyone. So now can, is anyone, um, particularly women with the inordinate burden that they have, uh, did anyone escape trauma during COVID? Now everybody has yeah. experienced a measure of trauma. So that means all men, all women, but then disproportionately women. So then here we are talking about trauma and care. And the, they're the nurturers and the carers of the family. So they have experienced trauma and they're working around everyone around them experiencing trauma. So they're trying to hold together these families. And the other piece that you kind of mentioned, I just want to touch on it a little bit. There's a high incidence, I don't know if it's more during the COVID, but of sexual assault and uh, 
harassment and so on of women mm -hmm. today, <clears throat> which led right. to that kind of trauma <laughs> picture. Yeah, it, it, yeah, that's a really good way of, of stating that it adds to the burden that's already there. Um, and because women were isolated during that time, there was a surge in increase in violence because then they couldn't just leave and go somewhere else. Okay. There was nowhere to go, which is heartbreaking. You can't let yourself, um, if I let myself really dive into that thought process, um, I wouldn't get through this interview right now because yeah. it's so hurtful to think that this is happening to women, um, not just through the population we're speaking to in the US and Canada, but far beyond that. And if you look at the, uh, the statistics of um, how many countries, uh, it's nearly, gosh, it's 175, something like that. I don't wanna get my stats wrong, but um, of countries that still don't have equitable, equitable policy for women and the United States tops that list. Yeah, it's a burden that we can't get out from underneath. And because traditionally women are con conditioned to be those nurturing caregivers, there's an expectation and social norm that like, if I use this cup, you know, as the metaphor, like, how do we keep if our cup isn't full, how are we going to fill every everyone else's, you know, mm -hmm. if my emotional, spiritual, even physical needs, because we are at a financial um, disadvantage because of a lack of policy. This cup's not even full. Mm -hmm. And then now the social norm is I'm supposed to fill everyone else's cup around me, but what if there's nothing in it? Yeah. Because we start out at a disadvantage. The moment we're born, we start out with that disadvantage. So it's a I think that problem. a lot of people, a lot of women, particularly who are just shouldering these burdens, have experienced things that would be considered trauma. They don't consider what they're doing living through trauma. They consider what they're doing just living. Living. The time to redefine. I feel like trauma, the, the word itself is a little bit less meaningful. Is it time to redefine trauma or create a definition that speaks specifically to the complexity? of women's lives and experiences, particularly, you know, you, I mean, right now there's a war going on and you see these women holding their families together in a war zone. Um, is, there, is there a need for another way to talk about trauma in women? Well, without a doubt, just the, you know, the description that, um, and the, the, the portrait, you know, the accurate portrait that we see uh, stretched far and wide across this tiny planet Earth would beg for a, a broadened definition of it. You know? So I think that everyone could probably agree, at least half, half the people that hold up the sky, you know, mm -hmm. could agree. Um, and a lot of, of other individuals um, as well. So no genders excluded here. Um, but because women generally suffer at the hands of men, either through emotional violence, psychological violence, and or physical violence, we do need, it's like a giant public you know, health education campaign to remove that stigma that comes um, with someone saying they've experienced trauma. Mm -hmm. Because in many ways, it's kind of like the cup, you know, comparison, you know, analogy or uh, metaphor, however you want to look at it. It's kind of like uh, that, that um, if we look at ourselves as being weaker or just weak because you have a mental health issue resulting from something that was outside of your control. Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. You know, people look at depression or anxiety, PTSD and chronic PTSD. People look at those things as, and there's a, and we know there's a stigma, but it's, it's even worse on women. Like, well, if you were only stronger, if you'd only bootstrap this thing, if you only did more yoga, you know, 
if you only lit a candle more often, if you only got a manicure or did some kind of self-care more often, it is a commoditized, trivialized yeah. thing that people have, and we're all you know, complicit in that, of turning mental health issues that women particularly suffer into something that they can just strong arm and get through. You know what you brought up, I think is super important because one of the things I think that trauma does, even though we haven't defined trauma, but I think everybody can kind of relate to what we're talking about. But one of the things that trauma does is robs us of our stories. Uh, All of those things you were just talking about are, we're not always feeling like we can represent. We literally can lose our voices. Isn't that right? Oh, yeah. Can you yeah. talk about, because I know this is a big part of your work, and this is kind of what I wanted to, uh, some dots that I wanted to connect. Can you talk about the effect of trauma literally on our voices? Yeah. Um, okay, so I remember not the very first time I sang, yeah, I remembered that. And it was in church and I felt relatively safe and it was, you know, that was okay. But I am remembering early times when I had to speak or sing. And for most people, public speaking is a, it's a moment, right? So let's just, we'll take trauma out of it for a second and just say, I have to get up in front of a crowd or you have to get up in front of a crowd of, um, 6,000 people, 7,000 people and sing the national anthem, which I actually had to do multiple times. You have sung the national, wait a minute, you can't just (laughs) drop that and move on. (laughs) I'm sorry. You Um, sung the national anthem, I'm guessing at a sports arena or? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So um, you're terrified. I really don't know anybody that... listening to you talk about it. <laughs> yeah. So the very first time I had to do it and, you know, I, I got myself into it um, because somebody asked and I said, yes. So, you know, it was my choice. I'm terrified. I'm going to forget the words, you know? So I'm like, can I write key words on my hand? Like, you know, the national anthem, like, you know, the alphabet. I mean, you just, you just yeah. do until... Yeah. You're Until under, you know. <laughs> exactly. Until like the squeeze comes. This is my, I'm working on hand strength at my desk here. Until the squeeze comes and then you feel the squeeze and then what happens? So if this, you know, is kind of representing my vocal folds up here, the hyoid, the, the laryngeal area and the trachea, you know, in the front, when I have, when, you, when I have that stress, And oh, I remember it. And I've had the same stress multiple times thereafter. Everything in your neck kind of compresses like this, right? So these literal, you know, muscles of the uh, SCM, we call them the sternocleidomastoid, the platysma, the scalenes, the upper trapezius, which has a connection to the vagus even. Um, They all start to tighten. And, and the, you get butterflies. Some people have to run to the bathroom. You know, they might even veer off towards the diarrhea moment, right? Of when they are so um, impacted by stress. And, you know, when people are in, let's move from just having to sing in front of a big crowd and not forget the words and not get a frog in your throat because we all know what that feels like, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but then to the the deeper aspects of that, if you have experienced trauma, what happens? You know, people can wet themselves, right? They can go to the bathroom. It's not, you know, in their control. They can have a vasovagal syncope and pass out. So there's this big spectrum of, oh, my, I notice muscles in my neck are tight. Mm -hmm. That is automatically sending a message of not just a literal um, sensation that closes down your vocal cords because of the intimate connections of the musculoskeletal and neuromuscular um, makeup of that area. But it also sends a message of stress to the brain. 
So now, even if we didn't realize it, um, we get that feeling of stress that changes the voice. It does lock down the voice. The vocal folds are not gonna oscillate like this and make beautiful sound. You get altered pressures. So altered intra, intra abdominal pressure, interthoracic, subglottal pressure, and then things start to go south. And, and I've been there trying to sing before when I was nervous. You have no, no vocal modulation whatsoever. Instead of um, singing a, um, uh, a song like Amazing Grace that everybody knows, which is not necessarily you know, um, even religious, is instead of singing uh, Amazing Grace, I might sing, uh, me, me, me. <laughs> you know? because your vocal folds just stop. They stiffen. Yeah. You know? So you can't be afraid and even swallow, right? Do you feel like eating uh, when you're afraid? Do you feel like drinking when you're afraid? No, GI shuts down. Your vocal folds will respond. You, if you can't swallow, right? You can't eat, you can't drink. You definitely can't sing. So the phylogenetic um, uh, evolutionary purpose of the vocal folds and that epiglottal area is to keep you from choking and make sure you can breathe, right? Mm -hmm. Speaking and singing and all that stuff comes way later. And that's where, you know, the vagus nerve is such a, like a buzzword. I think it's like you mentioned with trauma, it's starting to lose some of its impact. Mm -hmm. but in in when you when you study it long enough a you realize wow I don't know anything I need to learn more and yeah. then you learn that um the intimate connection of the vocal folds can control whether or not maybe you even tear when you give birth wow. that's another trauma for women's health wow so there are so many intimate connections like that's the literal connection of what happens to the voice but um I often you know, we'll think of it in terms of, you know, if you're afraid, yeah. your voice, it, your voice gets hoarse, it, it cracks, it's maybe softer or lighter, you, you're not speaking with uh, determination and confidence, you get timid, you feel smaller. And how many of you, you know, listening have felt that you feel like you're a smaller version of yourself. And that can come from your voice. I'm going to ask you more about the vagus nerve in a minute. Um, cause I know people in yoga are particularly interested in that, but I'm really, uh, curious about someone who's not singing the national anthem, um, on yeah. those days, <laughs> on those infrequent days <laughs> when you're not singing the national anthem for 6,000 people, but suppose that you are a victim of some trauma in your life or you've had a relationship in a domestic violence or you know any kind of trauma situation in the past, is that gonna keep affecting your voice? Absolutely. And so there's two points I wanna make. One, yes, the randomized control trial is important, okay? but the N of one is important. And the reason I say the N of one is it's the person in front of you at that moment and their lived experience and story. And if they've been a victim of domestic violence, I have the utmost compassion for them because I'm a survivor. So I know as the N of one, what it does to your voice and you can hear it now, like uh, you try not to get upset about that, but you can hear the difference in my voice mm -hmm. when you do. If I were to try and break into to a, a, you know song now, I couldn't do it uh, because there's such a heavy grief there that begins to take over and change your voice immediately. It wavers, it cracks, it's, it's not very strong. Um, so for all of you out there who have suffered through the terror of domestic violence, you're not alone. And I'm sorry that you ever had to go through that. But there are things you can do. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to pull you out of this, Ginger, uh, by getting your geeky hat on. 
that'll do it. That'll do it. I know. I know the strategy. <laughs> you went over here. Uh, so we got to go yeah. to Vegas Nerve. We got to go to the Wandering Nerve and uh, talk first generally, but then how is it going to play into this picture? This, not just the vocal picture, but the whole, um, the whole yeah. role. Yeah. With trauma. That's to me the power and i i will never throw some out to someone the trite suggestion of just do this or do that um because it can come out in a way that is not empathetic it's not just about remember it's not just about more self-care more yoga do more breathing it's so much more layered and complex than that um so i never want to you know in a trite way throw that out to anyone but if we get very kind of granular and specific about the things that can be done based on what the person in front of you needs, um, then we can begin to move in um, a direction that builds a sense of safety with the person. And I think that might be our first stopping off point. Like that's our first waypoint, you know? Um, we're getting off the Vegas nerve bus. We look around and say, okay, what can we do? first to help someone through this and that is to create a sense of safety that may be the biggest thing that we do for helping ourselves uh, through trauma or someone else through trauma is to create a therapeutic landscape that feels safe and comforting and in order to come out of like where i was <clears throat> just a second ago required that it required me to say I'm totally in a safe environment. I'm talking to Lynn. She's fantastic. She's going to lead this in a way that I know um, acknowledges hurt and suffering, and then also helps us to find, you know, the the uh, the next waypoint, that light. And again, I think safety is is that piece for you. So if you're listening, I would um, ask you to whether you call it mindfulness meditation, prayer, or some kind of internal mantra, just whatever it is, it doesn't matter what you call it, is to imagine a time where you felt completely safe. Mm -hmm. Go there in your mind and sit with it. And that might be the most powerful thing you begin to do for vagal tone first. So I wanna just clarify something because I feel like the, interaction with the vagus nerve goes in both directions it is like the barometer right of risk it's a barometer of uh of danger correct but it is also a vehicle of healing because if you can get better what's called vagal tone and this isn't just about the throat we pointed to the throat but the it's called the wandering nerve because it touches every vital organ, right? So it is both the kind of harbinger of risk and navigator of, am I saying this correctly? It's both the harbinger of risk and the navigator of healing in some ways. Is that, am I on the right track? Yeah, if, if I use an analogy of a, of a yoga pose for a moment, <clears throat> excuse me, I will often use a yoga posture diagnostically. I will have someone move through, uh, you know, a, a pose, an asana, but I also use it therapeutically. And that's kind of what the vagus nerve does too. Um, I can look at vagal tone and evaluate that in order to determine something. It's a fancy word for detecting risk called neuroception. It may emerge as the most important sense of awareness we have about ourselves. We talk a lot about proprioception and other types, right? But maybe neuroception is the most important. So in terms of the diagnostic quality of what the vagus nerve is, it's almost like it's a little red flag, like, oh, what's going on here? I mm -hmm. detect risk. Then we have to ask ourselves, and this is where self-awareness and reflection comes in. Am I accurately detecting whether a situation is threatening or not? And for women, and this is a social norm we must break, we are often taught to accept 
poor treatment from spouses, partners, other people, and stick with it for the sake of fill in the blank, right? Mm -hmm. Which then puts us constantly at harm's risk all the time. Mm -hmm. So we have to ask ourselves, am I detecting risk appropriately? And in the past, um, historically speaking, if women did speak up, what happened? You're dismissed, you're marginalized, you would be genuinely called hysterical, you might even be committed, like horrible things happened to women in the past that haven't entirely gone away. Women can still be easily dismissed and discarded. Um, and there are studies to back that up. So we still, are that intergenerational trauma persists of women's voices not being respected and, and, and heard. So I think that you have to trust yourself first. And if you feel like you're being threatened and something is not safe, then and you're not sure if, if what you're feeling is accurate, that's where uh, finding a really good therapist can help because they can help you determine, is this situation unsafe for me? The job, the relationship, um, whatever it is, and then help you set boundaries for that. So that's the diagnostic side. Am I detecting risk appropriately? But then some of the very things you do to learn, am I detecting risk appropriately become your healing pathway, mm. you know? That becomes just like the pose is diagnostic, the pose is therapeutic. Mm -hmm. um, same thing, vagus nerve can be diagnostic of what's going on. Mm -hmm. But then if we use some of these interventions, it becomes your pathway to freedom. That's a really beautiful thought. So you did mention some, um, ideally we're looking for vagal tone and vagal tone means we're resilient. We, not everything in our lives goes great, but we're handling it better. Is that a good? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Cause that still happens. Yeah, we don't get dragged into the mud. We just put on our galoshes and learn how to how to slog mm -hmm. through it. And you did mention some yoga practices, mm -hmm. but I also am sensing what you're saying is that there's a bigger picture. There's a team at work. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then the team is not just yoga. It's other forms of mental health care. Right, right. Um, I will talk, um, gosh, I, I could launch right into the sciencey, nerdy, geeky side of this, but yeah. um, I, I find that it, if we just speak plainly about it, uh, about the things we've learned in the literature and where we should be moving forward in research, it's much more effective than, um, than citing statistics. So yes, yoga can't fix it all. Like, that's kind of the take home message, unfortunately. If it could, then what a world we would live in. But then we would be looking for um, the ultimate savior or fix in other things too. Yeah. Like opioids were billed as a fix and, and, and they're not. Surgery can sometimes be billed you know, as a fix, right? So the conventional, not conventional, but kind of biomedical side of healthcare, which is important, it can say absolutely save your life doesn't get it all right either. Yeah. You know, so it is part of an integrative approach that even after doing this for over two decades, um, even after doing yoga for as long as I have and, and getting three degrees, which, um, you know, are finally paid for, <laughs> um, I, and being a teacher of teachers, you know, a teacher yeah. of therapists, yeah. I will never feel like I've arrived at, at being some subject matter expert because there's always something else to learn. There's always something else to pick up on. So even though I have the yoga teacher, yoga therapist, you know, doctor background, um, I have a whole team that I work with and refer to yes. that people are going to need mental health care and it's going to be specific. So as a therapist, I need to make sure I'm familiar with those approaches of EMDR and CBT and uh, acceptance and commitment therapy, a ACT. All, there's all kinds of approaches that will need to be adjunct to what I'm doing so that together we can carry women out of trauma that historically they've never gotten help for. 
That's but so with the amazing. science we have available to us now, yeah. I feel like we, it's a good time to be alive. You know, we, we have the tools. Well, the great news for us, mere yoga teachers who want to be part of the team and want to be in our lane. Uh, and I'm a big believer in all of the wonderful things we can do with yoga, certainly to build vagal tone. You are going to be teaching a three-part course for us on the topic of beyond trauma-informed yoga, which is going to delve into cutting edge trauma techniques in working with women's health. So you're going to be breaking a lot of this down in this course, correct? Yeah. The way that yoga teachers can use it and people who've suffered with uh, trauma, not just yoga teachers can use it. Yeah. I, I started out as a yoga teacher and then an athletic trainer. And then I just, I just, just can't going. stop learning. If I had the funds, I'd love to get a doctor in public health. And so we can, we can all keep going. So yeah. I know what you feel like from or if you're listening and you're a yoga teacher, I totally been there. I know what that feels like. Um, 30 years ago, that's what I was doing. Um, and I just made a concerted effort decide, to decide, you know, I want to learn this. I want to le learn that. But w mm -hmm. whatever your path is, um, you have a place and you have power. And I love the quote, no one else is you and that's your power. Mm -hmm. So if you're watching this as a yoga teacher or a yoga therapist or a, a, a DPT or an OT or an MD, whatever you are, um, mental health professional, um, you have such a skill set already that will, that's why you're listening, right? Because we all want to learn more. Um, that will help you plug into a team. And I just can't emphasize enough the importance of making sure that you are part of a team. For example, I'm in Greensboro, North Carolina, and I just moved here three years ago, which seems like yesterday considering COVID, right? The month before I opened my practice, um, uh, COVID hit the month after, right? So I opened my practice and then the next month COVID. It's taken me longer to build that team, but mm -hmm. I know at the level that I practice, um, I'm never autonomous, so I'm never independent. I'm never just treating everything and fixing everything myself, that I have a mental health um, therapist that I work with. I have a registered dietitian, integrative nutritionist that I work with. I have a functional medicine um, nurse practitioner, a functional medicine MD. Um, I've built a team so that I can scale from a business aspect what I'm doing. Um, I know yoga teachers, yoga therapists in the area, like I'm continuously building that team, um, which now, thankful um you know thanks to um technology can be more um national and international right sure. so our team can sure. be so broad yeah. Yeah. that we can pull from so many wonderful people um i'm constantly trying to build that team so that when these red flags come up mm -hmm. and i know that someone um i had a case recently that needed that mm -hmm. we work through so much so if you're working through something in a class or with a one-on-one -on -one as a yoga teacher, um, when you, and I'll discuss the red flags in the, in the course, but when you see these things, these red flags, yeah. um, build your team. You and, know when to refer. Right, you know when to refer. Yeah. You scale your, that's also smart. It's not just it, ethically it, it correct, but it's a good. Like, it also sounds like you're going to cover the complexity of the whole picture, like give a bigger picture so that, which I guess explains the words in the title beyond trauma and for informed yoga, that it's, you're going to pull the lens back a little bit to that bigger picture of the whole person. Right. And other. The and I hope to do that. Yeah. I, I, that's my aspiration. You know, I think that um, it's probably a little bit over three hours in the three parts because I tend to fiddle, try to fit too much in. I'm trying to fit 10 pounds into a two pound sack uh, because I just want to give you as much as possible. I hope that the course is helpful in that way because there's a lot of talk about trauma informed, trauma insensitive. It is the new buzzword, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I believe that it is, has lost its meaning because of that. There are many ways to be trauma-informed without providing trauma care. They're ah, different. Okay. 
a, a so, class can be trauma informed, but not provide the care, you know. So you're going to break down some definitions around trauma, some definitions around the vagus nerve and vagal tone, and give us the bigger picture of what's going on because it's a really much more prevalent issue than we might think on the surface because so many people are putting a good face on things. Oh goodness, yes. Aren't women also taught from a slightly different angle? What you said is so important. We're also taught to mask. Like, how do you know if someone's even suffering when they come into your class or one-on-one? -on -one? Exactly. And are they going to trust you enough to share that information? That's a really vulnerable thing for someone uh, to do is to say, this has happened to me. You know, and we should all I'm be so okay. lucky. Yeah, we should all be so lucky to never learn the lesson that you can never tell how someone is feeling by looking at them. Um, but the fact is, we can't. And so I'm really ha happy that you're doing this course because I think it'll be a great service to our folks, but also just the yoga world in general. So Ginger, thank you so much for sharing so generously your story and your uh, history and your uh, great depth of knowledge. And we'll be looking forward to your course. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks for thank having you. me. It was lovely to talk Always about it. Always a pleasure. Yeah. So we'll see you next time and, and I'll see you at your course. Okay. <laughs> bye, All right. Bye, everybody.